All right, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 5. Nehemiah chapter 5. We had to end quickly last week because I talked too slow, I guess, or talked too much about certain things and didn't uh, speed up enough. Um, but tonight we're going to try to walk through all of Nehemiah chapter 5. It's about 19 verses, um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a passage that I think we need and want to understand and unpack because uh, the, the, the title that I've, I've given this tonight is Determination for the Journey. Um, and we all um, are on a journey, a journey of life, and we need to be, have that determination to get through the journey. I want to give kind of a brief recap of what got us to this point, where we've been in the last couple of weeks through to up to chapter 5. Uh, kind of the, the theme that we've given for the study on Nehemiah is that when God wants to accomplish a work, He always prepares His workers and puts them in the right place at the right time. Hopefully that's starting to stick. Um, it's something we've said about every week, um, and it's a great reminder. It's a great reminder for us that maybe wondering why you're in the place that you're in or why you're, where you, what is God doing with you there, where, where you're at in the moment. It's because God's preparing you for something. He's preparing you for something. He's putting you where you need to be in order to fulfill the task that he's given you. Uh, chapter 1, we're introduced to Nehemiah as the cupbearer to the king, and he hears about Jerusalem being in trouble. The walls are broken. He wept, he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. Chapter 2, he, um, four months have passed of praying and fasting, and he goes before the king, and the king asks what's going on, and he, 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 he tells him, look, my homeland is in, in ruins. The king grants him permission to go and rebuild. Again, a king that is not um, a believer, right? He, he, is, he is not a believer, and he, Nehemiah uh, was a trusted man in the king's court, but he allows Nehemiah to go back. He gives him protection. He gives him supplies and armed guard, and God goes above and beyond, um, and he uses an unsaved king to do it. Um, just amazing to see how God, God continued. God can make the things that seem impossible possible. Um, and so then we see chapter three, we walk through all of those names, um, all of those names and the groups that were a part of the process. And we're going to see that again in chapter seven. So get ready for chapter seven coming up in a couple of weeks. But we saw all the names and groups that were a part of the process and reminded us that the work of God is accomplished through the family of God working together. Uh, that it's a wor the, the work of God is accomplished through all of us as the people of God working together and that we all have a place and we all have a purpose in that. Um, chapter 4, we saw criticism and discouragement come. It came from the outside. Right? People were tired. They were weary. They were burdened by the work. And Nehemiah reminds them that they're in this together. Right? They're in it together and that they, are, they, are, they must remember that, the, that he said uh, that line that we kind of looked at very, very quickly last week, but it was one of the most, I think, most important lines in chapter four is to remember the great and awe-inspiring God. Right? When, you're, when you're going through discouragement, remember God. Look to God. Look to him. Um, and so he's encouraging them. And now in chapter five, the threat goes from the outside in chapter four now to the inside. Right? It, it, it's interesting how that happens. Right? It started on the outside with a couple of guys who were coming and bringing their people and, and making fun of them and, and, and causing a scene. Um, and now the threat goes from outside to within to the people. And um, many times when we deal with issues, dealing with issues internally are harder than dealing with external issues. Right? When the issue moves inside the walls, it becomes difficult. Even, even more difficult, and I think we must know this, that no matter what we face as believers, inside or outside attacks, we must remain focused on the goal. And I think that's what we'll see Nehemiah doing. He's trying to remind them that they have a goal, and we must remain focused on that, no matter whether the attacks are on the inside or the outside. And, and that the goal is doing the work that God has called us to do. We have to stay focused on doing what God wants us to do because the enemy does not want us to be focused on that. He wants to pull our attention away from everything from that and put it on everything else that he can. And so let's look at chapter 5 together and we'll walk through this and then kind of talk about what we see here in God's Word. Verse 1 of chapter 5 says this, There was a widespread outcry from the people and their wives against the, their Jewish countrymen. Some were saying, We, our sons and our daughters, are numerous. Let us get grain so that we can eat and live. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, vineyards, and homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have borrowed money to pay the king's taxes, king's tax on our fields and vineyards. We and our children are just like our countrymen and their children, yet we are subjecting our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters are already enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and vineyards belong to others. 
I became extremely angry when I heard their outcry and these complaints. After seriously considering the matter, I accused the nobles and officials, saying to them, Each of you is charging his countrymen interest. So I called a large assembly against them and said, We have done our best to buy back our Jewish countrymen who were sold to foreigners. But now you sell your own countrymen, and we have to buy them back. They remained silent and could not say a word. And then I said, What you are doing isn't right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God and not invite the reproach of our foreign enemies? Even I, as well as my brothers and my servants, have been lending them money and grain. Please let us stop charging this interest. Return their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses to them immediately, along with the percentage of the money, grain, new wine, and fresh oil that you've been assessing them. They responded, We will return these things and require nothing more from them. We will do as you say. So I summoned the priest and made everyone take an oath to do this. I also shook the folds of my robe and said, May God likewise shake from his house and property everyone who doesn't keep this promise. May he be shaken out and have nothing. The whole assembly said, Amen, and they praised the Lord. Then the people did as they had promised. Furthermore, from the day King Artaxerxes appointed me to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year until his 32nd year, 12 years, 32nd year, 12 years, I and my associates never ate from the food allotted to the governor. The governors who preceded me had heavily burdened the people, taking from them food and wine as well as a pound of silver. Their subordinates also oppressed the people, but because of the fear of God, I didn't do this. Instead, I devoted myself to the construction of this wall, and all of my subordinates were gathered there for the work. We did not buy any land. There were, 100, there were 150 Jews and officials, as well as guests from the surrounding nations at my table. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some fowl were prepared for me. An abundance of all kinds of wine was provided every 10 days, but I didn't demand the food allotted to the governor because the burden on the people was so heavy. Verse 19, remember me favorably, my God, for all that I have done for this people. So we see some interesting things begin to happen here. And one thing I think we see uh, that we can all kind of maybe not say amen to, but realize this is true in our life is that conflict is inevitable. Right? Whenever there's a group of people, there will be conflict. Conflict happens, right? The, the question when it comes to conflict is how do we handle it? Right? How do we handle conflict when it happens? Nehemiah is dealing with conflict yet again. Uh, this time again, amongst those who are supposed to be working together to accomplish the mission. Right? This is not outside. Remember, chapter 4 was outside. Now it's moved inside the doors, inside the walls. And so they're dealing with the conflict of people who are supposed to be working together. And we see the outcry in verse 1. It's from the Jews about the Jewish people. Right? They, are, they are not crying out against people of the land or against the, the Sanballats and the Tobias and, the, and Geshem. The issue comes about because of the way that the people of God are relating to one another. It comes about because how we're treating other people. Right? How they were treating each other, the ones that they're supposed to be caring for, loving, taking care of. Instead, they're taking advantage of. And, and we see that as a problem. We see it as a problem here. I, I think one of, the, one of the studies you can do um, in the Bible, I think it's a great study to do, and we've, I've, I've kind of led a study through it before, and I think it's something we'll probably do again in the future, um, but it's the one another study, where you study the one another's throughout the New Testament. Uh, Paul, was, Paul used a lot of one another statements, and it's all about how we take care of one another, right? Love one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, um, um, and there, there's a whole gamut of those one another's there, and it's all about how we interact with one another as a church, as people. Right? As, as human beings, how do we take care of one another? Right? We, 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 the picture is those one another statements encapsulate really what Jesus did for us. Right? He loves us. He prays for us. He encourages us. He's there for us. Right? He exhorts us. Right? Uh, and and he, we confess sin to one another. Right? All these different things. It's this great picture. But what we see here in Nehemiah 5 is that none of that is happening. Right? It's, it's all gone out the window. In our lives as believers, some of the biggest problems that we face will, will be with how we relate to each other. Right? Not necessarily how we relate to the people on the outside, but how we relate to people on the inside, meaning in the, in, with people within the church. Right? We have enough opposition to handle outside the family. We don't need it on the inside. I, I don't know about you, but I'm sure you've experienced this before. Church hurt is some of the worst hurt you could have in your life. Right? When, when, when you get hurt inside the church, it hurts. There are a lot of other hurts that hurt, but church hurt is some of the worst. Right? It's some that you can never get over because I think it hurts so bad because you know that it's people you should trust. Right? And it should love you no matter what and should forgive and be praying for you, not criticizing, condemning, and complaining against you. 
But that's what we see happening so often in churches. And it hurts. And it turns people against the church. But we have enough to handle on the outside. We shouldn't have to do it on the inside. But that's what we see. Right? There, there are a few main issues that come up in, in Nehemiah chapter 5. And I want to address some of those that were causing the issues. Um, the first being that even though they've been back in Jerusalem for, quite, for a little bit of time now, the infrastructure wasn't there to support the population. There were infrastructure issues, right? right? You ever seen that? We've, I think we've seen that happen, right? All around us, right? Infrastructure is not ready to see the growth and development that happens, right? And then what happens? You get overflowing um, sewer systems. The water plants can't keep up. All these different things happen, right? Same thing was happening here, right? Jerusalem was in ruins, Right? People come back to help rebuild. They, there, people come in from the, from the valleys and the hills to come into the city, but it's not been repaired yet, right? Verse 2 says, we, we see the, the work on the wall that, um, meant that the fields had gone unworked, right? They, they couldn't get what was needed to provide for their families. We see that in verse 2, right? There was, there was not enough food because there was, there was not enough workers to do the work in the walls and work the fields, Right? So the, the infrastructure wasn't there. They weren't able to get what they needed to take care of their families. Uh, the second thing was that their needs were increased by a recent famine. So not only were they not able to work the fields, but there was a famine that had just happened in the land. Look at, in verse 3, we see others were saying, we're mortgaging our fields, vineyards, and homes to get grain during the famine. Right? Uh, not only they couldn't work the fields, but the famine it, uh, it, it made the problem worse. Right? They, they needed food, right? Families were going hungry, right? And, and we can agree on the fact that when you reach a certain level of hungry, it becomes not very pleasant, right? I know in my house, when the kids or myself reach a certain level of hung, hunger, it becomes hangry, right? And it's never a good thing, right? And, and we know that, all right, somebody needs to eat, eat, eat some candy, eat some chips, eat something, right? So you can chill out. Right? The, the people are going to great lengths to get needed food. And they say with, with even mortgaging their property, can you imagine just having to mortgage your home, mortgage your, your land just to get food? Right? Just to be able to provide for your family. In, in essence, it's like a fire sale of property. Just to be able to take care of your family and the resources um, to, to, to live and then to keep building the wall. They were taking desperate measures. But there was more, right? More was happening here. But the third thing is that people had to pay heavy taxes. Uh, verse 4. I'm going to say in verse 4 again. Still others were saying, we have borrowed money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. We and our children are just like our countrymen and their children, yet we are subjecting our sons and daughters to slavery. Right? It didn't matter that they weren't able to work. You still had to pay taxes. Right? The king did not suspend his tax on the produce of the fields and the land. The people needed to get food they also to, to, to feed their families, but they also needed to get food to be able to pay the taxes. So it just, again, escalated the issue. Escalated the issue. Right? It took it a step further. So people are borrowing money to get food and to pay their taxes. They're going into more debt just to help themselves be able to eat and pay off the taxes. I mean, some had to sell their children into slavery. Can you imagine? Just to put food on the table and just to stay out of debt with the king. Now, why? Well, this is where it gets really messy when we think about why and we try to understand why this was happening. Because in times of need, the first place that you should turn should be where? Church. Your family. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Our community, our, our fellow believers, However, this was the biggest issue for them is that the leaders were taking advantage of the people for selfish benefit rather than helping those in need. They were taking advantage. Look at verse 5. Uh, again, we, are children, uh, we and our children are just like the countrymen and their children, yet we are subjecting our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters are already enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. Instead of helping each other out, they take advantage of each other. They were exploiting their brothers in a time of need. Ex can you exploiting the other people, the ones that they're supposed to care for, love, uh, forgive, be there for? They were exploiting them. They were charging them high interest rates, putting them at risk of losing everything, right? Including their freedom. The, the, the fact of, of lending money is not the issue. It was the charging of interest. And not just simple interest, but high interest, right? I mean, you were, we must treat people with love, Right? 
you were both people and land belonged to the Lord, and he would not have anyone using either for personal gain, right? We see that really spelled out in Deuteronomy 23. This whole picture, right? But it's become a big problem for the people, a big issue. The famine, the, the land that can't produce because it's not ready, the taxes, people taking advantage of their brothers and sisters. It's a mess. And it's all happening within the walls of the city, within the people who were there working day and day and day and night together to rebuild the wall. But they're not just there helping, they're there hurting. And look how Nehemiah responds, though, in verse 6. He says, I became extremely angry. I became angry when I heard the outcry. He got mad. I mean, who wouldn't? When you see injustice happening, our response is anger. Right? When you see things happening, people are getting taken advantage of, it should make you angry. Right? Injustice, it was happening between people who should be caring for one another, but instead they were hurting one another. But, but, but look, th- there, there is a, a vital truth that's tucked in here that we can learn from. And, and, and that vital truth that we can learn from in regards to th- this picture is, is I, I think it's uh, a truth that's pointed out back in, or in James chapter 1. Right? And it's be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger doesn't produce righteousness, the righteousness that God desires. Right? It's also found in Proverbs. A fool, fools give full vent to their anger, their rage, but the wise brings calm. Or the wise stays calm. Oftentimes, our best plan of action is to, ta- is to step back and take a breath. Right? Because ne- Nehemiah got very angry. How many times have you gotten very angry in your life and you reacted out of anger instead of reacting out of how we should have reacted? Every time I've reacted out of anger in my life, you know what it always leads to? Me apologizing for something I said or did that was wrong. Something I said or did that was dumb. We can just be honest with ourselves, right? Uh, Because that's when, when we react out of anger, when we give full vent to our rage, full vent to our anger, right? It never leads to anything profitable. Right? It always leads to, to, diffi- to more difficulty. So what is our best plan of action? To step back and take a breath. Uh, maybe even step back, take a breath, and say a prayer. Lord, help me chill out in this situation. Help me to think clearly, which is what Nehemiah did. Look at verse 7. He says, after seriously considering the matter, after seriously considering the matter, self-control is vital. Nehemiah took a step back. He considered what was happening, right? The words he used literally mean, my, mean this, that my heart consulted with me, right? He had a heart consultation. He, he stepped back. He had a heart consultation. I, I read a study done on four-year-olds to see how well they could control themselves and resist temptation, right? It's always interesting, right, to see how, because a lot of times they can't, right? We have uh, two kids around that age, Nash and Tate, two and five, right? And they really have no... Um, control. Like they can't resist temptation, right? If you see Nash, he's a cookie. How many times you say, don't eat that cookie? He's going to eat that cookie, right? He's just going to happen, right? Um, I don't know if it's because he's number seven or what, but um, it's just, he's going to do it, right? But in this study, they were given a choice, right? They can get five pieces of candy if they can wait 10 minutes until the teacher comes back or just two pieces if they can't control the urge to wait, Right? And that was the test. You've probably seen a test like this before. It's, it's, there's been many of them done, and I know this was not the first one, but this is just an example of one. And so the, the test began, as you, as you can imagine, any, any four-year-old or maybe even adult men, right? When we see candy in front of us, we get fidgety, right? Um, begin to fidget, right? And, and fidgeting our seat the whole time as if they're being tortured, right? I can just picture my kids doing this, right? One boy, it said in the study, counted the candy over and over and over. For all 10 minutes, they just, she just counted. Well, or he just counted the candy. One girl looked up to heaven, it seemed, and asked God for help. Seven out of nine lasted the full 10 minutes. Several spent the last few minutes with their hand kind of hovering over the candy, just kind of praying like that it would, I don't know, praying that it would come through them or they would be controlled. But self-control for some of us is, is summed up in the old um, potato chip commercial. You ever heard this, right? Bet you can't eat just one, Right? Because we can't. We have no self-control when it comes to things, right? Sometimes we just need to back away, to step away, right? Nehemiah was angry. He was ticked off. He knew he had a right to be angry. Many times if you're angry about something, you know that you, you may have the right to be angry about it. 
But you also have the right to respond correctly, right, as a believer, right? You have to handle it correctly. One thing we have to understand is that, that it is not best to say the first thing that comes to your mind when you're angry, right? Usually it's not best to say the second thing that comes to your mind or maybe even the third thing that comes to your mind when you're angry. That's why it's best to step back. But one of our biggest learning experiences in our lives as people is figuring out how not to let our emotions control us. We're emotional people, right? We have emotions, right? And sometimes they can control us. And when they do control us, it's not a good thing. Nehemiah got control, called together an assembly, and he called out those who were exploiting the people. He called them out. Just because you take a step back and exert self-control doesn't mean that you don't handle the problem. You still handle the problem. You just handle it the right way the first time. Instead of handling it a wrong way, going back and apologizing and then trying to recoup and regather yourself and handle it the correct way the second time. Right? He, took, he, he, he handled the issue, and he gives some sound advice on how to solve the situation. And I think that's something we can learn from. Look at verse 10 and 11. He says again, Even I, as well as my brothers and my servants, have been lending them money and grain. Please let us stop charging this interest. Return their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses to them immediately, along with the percentage of money, grain, new wine, and fresh oil that you've been assessing them. Uh, in essence, he's saying this is what needs to be done. One, you need to be generous. We, we need to be generous, right? We shouldn't be charging interest. We should be giving away money, right? We should be giving away the things. When people, there's a need, you meet the need, right? So this poor, my pastor, he still says this. I still hear him say, I listen to his messages sometimes. He still says it. Um, when you see a need, you meet a need, right? You don't pray for God to send someone else to meet the need. If you can meet the need, you meet the need. I've I, I, never forget, and I'm probably going to get this illustration wrong, but it was one of those that just kind of impacted me, and in the, in the, in the, you'll, you'll understand the, the, the gist of it as I explain it. Um, but there was a, a, a story about a, um, a family who sat down to pray at dinner one night, and there was a need that one of the family members brought up, and they asked to the dad, can you pray about this at dinner? And so as they were saying the blessing on their dinner, they were like, can, Lord, we need to help us meet this, help, help this family with the need that they have. And they noticed that the young boy, um, probably five, six years old, um, did not close his eyes and did not participate in the prayer that night. And after they finished praying, they said, well, why didn't you pray? And he said, Dad, why are we praying about that need when you can meet that need? When God's already given you what you need to meet, I mean, some wisdom coming from a child, right? Um, and, and many times we do that. We, we pray for God to meet a need when he's already given you the resources to meet that need. We just don't like to let go of it, to, to meet it, right? Or to let go of the time, not just always, not always just money, it's to let go of the time that we have to be able to meet that need. We need to be generous. Nehemiah says, I gave of myself, my brothers, my servants, as an example. He's not bragging, right? You could read that and say, well, he's bragging. But he's not bragging. He's, he's giving an example, right? He's saying, we have already been doing this and you need to do the same. Generosity is always, always the right path. Being generous being generous. And he says, then he also says, don't take advantage of people. That's pretty simple, right? But sometimes we need to be reminded of the simple things. Don't take advantage. Stop taking advantage of people. It is never okay to take advantage of somebody. It's never okay. People were driving others even further away by taking advantage of their economic issues they were already in, right? They were, they were scattered, throughout, uh, scattered throughout the law are reminders to not do this very thing. Right? Exodus twenty two twenty five. If you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you are not to act as a creditor. You shall not charge interest. Explicitly in the word of God. Deuteronomy 23 says not to charge interest to your countrymen. And at the end has a promise. So that your Lord God may bless. There's, there is and was no reason for them to do this. They needed to trust God in it. Right? They needed to trust the Lord. I believe that is a main issue in Nehemiah, right here in Nehemiah. But also in our lives today is that we have trouble trusting God and having faith that he's going to be ring true on his promises, right? We, we can say that we do it, but when rubber hits the road, a lot of times we have trouble trusting. We have trust issues, right? Knowing that he's going to provide for our needs. Like we know that we can hear that and we can say it, like we can say it till we're blue in the face, right? But until it sinks in and really takes hold Right? It's, it's a difference. Right? Um, Nehemiah calls out the people on their sin. Hey, think about this question. What should you do when you become convicted of sin in your life? And that's, that's not a trick question. Right? What should you do when you become convicted of your sin in your life? I believe the answer is very simple. Stop doing it. Right? Stop and repent. 
When someone calls you out on your sin, stop and repent. You can't gradually stop sinning. Repent means turning the other way, right? Stopping and, and, and doing something, going in a different direction, right? Maybe there's something in your life that you need to do just that of, that you have been convicted of and that you've been running from, that you just need to stop doing and turn the other way and go the other way and repent from it and go. Right? And that brings us to the third thing, that to correct the situation as quick as possible. And how do you do that? Repent. Ask for forgiveness from the Lord first and then make it right. Right? And make it right. The, true repentance always inspires a desire to provide restitution. Right? True repentance always, always inspires a desire to provide restitution. Think about this. I mean, you can go throughout the scriptures and see this. Right? You think about Zacchaeus for a moment. I love the story of Zacchaeus. Old little bitty Zacchaeus. Right? Because you think about Zacchaeus and what did he do? Right? He wanted to catch a glimpse of Jesus, so he climbs up in the sycamore tree. Right? And because he, he's so small, he can't see through the people. Right? And he's up there, and, and he's just trying to get a glimpse of this guy. And he'd been, he was hated. He was, you know, everybody despised him because he stole their money. He was a tax collector. Right? He was hated. Nobody wanted to let him through. Just like, you know, you go to a, you go to a, um, a parade, and everybody lets the kids go up front, right? Because they want the kids to see. Nobody let, Zacchaeus was, was a wee little man, right? Uh, and uh, nobody wanted to let Zacchaeus up front to see Jesus. So he climbs a tree, and little known to him, right? What is Jesus? Jesus knows he's in that tree. And he stops, and he looks up, and he calls him down. And Zacchaeus' life has changed. But that is, the story doesn't stop there, does it? No, it goes on, and he says, no, he came, and he gave back more than he took from people, right? Because he, he, repentance led to restitution, right? He, 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 made, he righted the wrong that he had done, right? Nehemiah is not telling them to try and buy forgiveness, that's not the picture here. It's a desire to reverse the damage you've done. Now, that's hard, right? Because many times, that, 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 that always, not many times, always that involves you realizing that you were wrong. And if you're like me, we don't like to admit when we're wrong, right? That's just, I think that's just a man trait or whatever, but right, we don't like to admit we're wrong because it brings up shame, it brings up guilt, it brings up fear. What are they going to think if I go and I have to apologize for this? And restitution isn't always like, some restitution can just be going back and saying, I'm sorry, right? Writing your wrong is going back and admitting that you were wrong and then asking for forgiveness, right? That could be the restitution that you are, that repentance inspires in your life to go back to do with someone, right? It's hard. Verse 12 through 13, look at, look at how they respond. It says, they responded, we will return these things and require nothing more from them. We will do as you say. So I summoned the priest and made everyone take an oath to do this. He also said, verse 13, I also shook the folds of my robe and said, may God likewise shake from his house and property everyone who doesn't keep this promise. May he be shaken out and have nothing. They responded. How did they respond? We're going to do this. Right? We understand. We're going to do this. We will do as you say. Nehemiah had them make a promise. A promise to not only, not only between them, them, them and each other, right, each other, but also between them and God. Making a promise to the Lord is serious. Like Ecclesiastes 5, verses 4 and 5 says this. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Right? When, you, when you tell God, Lord, I'm promising I'm going to do this. You are making a vow to God. The Word of God says, if you're going to do that, you better do it. And don't hesitate. Take care of it. There, there, are, there are three actions that Nehemiah does in verse 13 that kind of emphasize the seriousness of the, the promise that they made. And we're going to go through these quickly, right? The first one is that he shook the folds out of his robe. It was symbolic, right? It, it was symbolic of what God would do with the, the money lenders if they didn't fulfill their promise, right? Shaking your robe was the Jewish act of, of condemnation, right? That they would be condemned if they kept up doing what they were doing. Um, and then the congregation said, amen, right? Significance was that they, they, that was their agreeance of what had been said and done within the assembly, right? They were agreeing upon it. And then they were in essence saying that we are in this together. We're not made to do this alone. We're going to come back together and do this together. And then thirdly, they praised the Lord together. Why? Because God enabled Nehemiah to help walk, work through their problems, he called out those who were taking advantage of others, and he encouraged repentance, which what brought back community, which brings back unity. It brings back healing. Unity was restored. Right? Many, sometimes you need to call out a wrong when a wrong happens for unity to come back. Many churches end up splitting 
Because they won't call out a wrong and people won't admit when they're wrong and say, sorry. How many church splits could have been um, kept from happening if people would have just admitted they were wrong and said, I'm sorry? And not letting pride and ego get in the way? How many things could have been prevented? Right? And uh, that, that's what we see. We have to deal with the problems but that, that come our way bef- before us head on and do it from a biblical standard, not our personal standard, but from what the Bible says. Bible says, meet it head on. Go at it, take, go at it with clean hearts, right? With a, with a, with a calm mind being when quick to listen and slow to speak, right? In a way and put in honoring Christ and how you handle it. Um, and then what do we see in the rest? Verses 14 through 19, we see in these closing verses, we see one of the great points of application, I believe, in Nehemiah. And, and that point of application is this, is that believers are to lead by setting the example and living out our faith. That sums up what we see in verses 14 through 19. Living out our faith. Nehemiah put serving others ahead of himself. He said he had been made governor, right? The, the, the top, which came with certain perks. But he chose not to take them in order for others to have what they needed. He was, he, with the governor came certain, certain statuses that he could have had. Certain amounts of food. Certain things done for him. He says, I didn't take those. Because there was people in need that needed them more than I did. Living out our faith, setting an example, be an example for others. Instead of using the privileges, he used them to help other people. Instead of using the privileges that he could have had, he used them to help. As God's children, our example is Jesus. And Jesus, he, what did he do? He laid aside all of his privileges. To be born of a virgin in a manger, despised, rejected, nailed to a cross, abandoned, and only to rise three days later. He laid aside everything for us. We see the example in Nehemiah, but we see it even more in Jesus. In how we are to live out our faith in this world. He modeled it. He modeled what it looks like to be selfless, to be sacrificial, to be loving. Why? Why did Nehemiah do this? The same reason we're supposed to. Look at verse, there's verse 19. Right? He says, remember me favorably, my God, for all that I have done. In essence, he's saying to please God. God, remember what I've done. Not because I want to be praised, but because I want to praise you for what I've done. Right? Because I want to please God. Not for the praise of man, but to the praise of God. Because we live for an audience of one. We don't live for an audience of of a crowd or to get pats on the back from other people. No, we live for an audience of one, and that is Jesus. God is at work all around us, within us, in in us, in our church, in our community, working in us. And and we must seek to understand that conflict will happen, but the issue is how do we handle it? Handle it head on. Be willing to step back. Be willing to come at it from a biblical perspective. With, uh, with a calm demeanor, with, with being with exactly what we see in what James says, right? We pointed that out earlier, right? That, that, that quick to listen, quick to hear, and slow to speak mentality. Take a breath, right? How many times do you have to do that with your kids and handling your kids? Right? Lord, don't let me do what I think I want to do right now. You know what I mean? Uh, Lord... We need some separation for a moment, right? And let me, hang, let me hang back for a minute, right? Same thing in dealing with people, right? Because people can be difficult. We can be difficult. I can be difficult, right? My wife tells me that a lot. You're difficult sometimes. I know. My mom tells me that too. Um, but with my mom, I think it's on purpose, right? I think that's our son. Our son I'm, re, I'm, I'm seeing that now because now I have five of them, right? I, I told my mom a long time ago, my job is to, is, to make, is, to, is to be a pain, right? And I was pretty good at that. I probably, she's still, I'm almost 40 years old. I'm still pretty good at being a pain in my mom's side, right? But, and now I'm, she's like, now you're reaping that, right? Of what you said to me, now you're seeing it fivefold. And I said, yes, ma'am. Um, but as believers, we confront it biblically, right? We confront conflict biblically. Not irrationally, not out of control, but biblically. We exhibit self-control, right? We, we, we show love. We call for repentance, we set the example. Always be willing to set the example. Remembering that you're here for a purpose, to stay focused on the Lord, to look to Him, to trust in Him, and to know that, yes, we are going to face conflict. We're going to face issues outside and inside. But it's all about how we handle them. And not letting it get to the point where fractions happen, where we hit it, hit it head on, we handle it biblically, we show love, 
We call for repentance and we do it in love and we set the example for each other and for a watching world because people are watching. People are watching at how we handle things in our life. When people know that you're a believer, they're watching at how you handle stuff because they're looking to call you out on things that they think that you stand for that maybe you don't or maybe you, you should stand for, but maybe they're looking for ways that you see you fall short and call you out on it. It's all about setting that example. So let's, let's pray together. Father, I pray in this moment, God, that you would help us to see in this word, in this passage, God, in Nehemiah, the example that he set, Lord. Lord, he was not a perfect man. But God, he was a man who followed you and stuck close to your word, who sought to do your will and your work. And Father, I pray, God, that as believers, God, we seek to do the same. God, that we seek to follow you, to trust you, to serve you, Lord. And that when conflict arises, Lord, we seek to handle it biblically. Not, not emotionally, not the way that we think we should handle it, God, but to handle it biblically, the way your word says it, Lord. To have a cool, a cool head about it, Lord. To listen more than we speak. To call out sin, Lord, in a loving way. Not a condemning way, but a loving way, Lord. God, that we call for repentance, that we show love, that we set an example, Lord. And that we do it with self-control. Father, help us, because I know that many times we, we face conflict, Lord, we haven't handled it the right way, Lord. And if there's a situation like that in our life, Lord, that we, then we apologize and we move forward, that we set it right. Father, I pray, Lord, for protection upon this place, Lord. Lord, we know that you're moving, and anytime you're moving, Lord God, there will be, there will be, Lord, the enemy will be on attack. And I pray for protection of this place, Lord, for protection of this community, Father. Father, that you help us keep our minds focused on you, Lord, to look to you and to continue to be an example to the community that's watching around us, Lord. Father, thank you for loving us, even when we sometimes speak when we shouldn't. Lord, when we handle things the way we shouldn't handle them, Lord, thank you for loving us anyway. Thank you, God, for the example that we see in Jesus, Lord. And we see a good example in Nehemiah, but we see a perfect example in Jesus. And Father, I pray that we continue to look to you and keep our eyes on Christ. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Guys, men, we'll see you Saturday morning. Seniors, we'll see you in the morning.